Hello, YouTube viewers. I'm Steve Gilley, and we have a brand new mountain lore story for you. Another bit of the folklore from this place we call home, Appalachia. It's called Wild Women of the Woods. Enjoy. If there's one thing we know how to do here in Appalachia, it's telling tales. And that's only natural, because we got a lot of folklore all its own, made up of monsters ghosts, jack tales, and a whole lot more. Sit back and listen now as we tell you all the lore of these mountains. You're listening to Mountain Lore, Tales from Appalachia. Urban legends are something we've told quite a few of in this series of podcast episodes we've done here on Mountain Lore. They're also... Well, Gina, what would you call an urban legend that wasn't in an urban center but out in the country? Oh, now you're asking me to think? <laughs> I don't know what you call that. Would it be like a country legend? Hmm. A rumor? Nah, possibly. Altogether, it's still folklore. And we have a set of stories we're going to tell you on this podcast about... Um, well, basically about wild women in the woods. That's what we're calling this. Wild women in the woods. Sounds like the <laughs> new reality show. <laughs> well, you never know. Somebody might listen to this podcast episode and I don't know, get an idea. No, what we've had are a whole series of stories around Appalachia that deal with... and. and and this, by the way, is back during the Victorian age and shortly thereafter, they deal with women getting out in the woods and going, well, you call it going wild, but not like what you'd think. It's actually not being civilized like animals, okay? I'm not going to get into the psychological part of that as to why men would fantasize and tell stories about women getting wild and back to nature in the woods in the Victorian era, but y'all can kind of figure that out yourselves. I think it's a <laughs> bit striking when you see pictures of people that have been raised by animals. Mm-hmm, yeah. So it, it not only would it be unusual, it would be, well, almost shocking. Yeah. These stories tend to spring from the pages of the newspaper, and that's where I got several of these stories, the reading of which would cause others to report they've seen the same thing, and then others see it, and pretty soon it's a phenomenon, kind of like all the waves of UFOs that were seen back in the 50s and 60s across the country. And for some reason, starting not long after the end of the Civil War, there was a wave of sightings of wild women living like animals in the forests and hills of Appalachia and beyond. And today we're going to tell you some of those tales straight from the pages of contemporary newspapers. Are you ready, Miss Gina? I am ready. All right, this is the first story in our series. And we go back to the spring of 1883 in one of the swamps between the mountains of western North Carolina near the town of Marion, where great excitement was caused by the discovery of a woman seen clothed in skins roughly fastened together with switches made of live oak. Now, all attempts to catch her were futile, as she was very fast and always managed to escape into the woods. After she had been pursued for a month, she suddenly disappeared, and it was supposed she'd been drowned in, you know, one of those stagnant pools of the swamp or been eaten by something up in the forest. Well, one day while some farmers were hunting in the woods, one of them, who'd stayed away from his companions, was startled to hear a quick cry. He looked in the direction from which the sound had come and was surprised to see a tall woman running off quickly through the undergrowth. He reported the fact, and since then, parties have been out every day trying to capture her, according to this newspaper article. The description given of her indicated that she was the, quote, legendary wild woman of North Carolina, which tells you there were other stories about wild women, in, at least in the state of North Carolina. Now, she'd been seen by many hunters who described her as being very tall, very thin, and very muscular. Her hair, which was long and matted, fell below her waist and was coal black. 
According to reports in newspapers at the time, it's been ascertained that her haunts were between Blanquies and Young's Bridges, a large portion of which is almost impenetrable with thickets, and deep, deep woods, and brush, and all that. Now, on Saturday morning, March 31st, 1883, she was supposedly surrounded by three hunters, Joseph Artigal, William Sizer, and Caleb Tunis. And as the men attempted to grab her, the woman tore a small sapling from the ground and so fiercely attacked and wounded the men that they were forced to retreat. Now, no reports, Gina, were made of any other attempts to capture this wild woman of North Carolina. Uh-huh. That's our first yeah. story. Probably, what, about... 10 to 15 years after the end of the Civil War. Uh, couldn't blame them for not wanting to try to catch the wild woman because the wild woman was too wild for them. Yeah, she whipped them with a switch. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Bet they didn't want to go home telling that one. No, no, they didn't. Now, for the next story, let's go north to Pennsylvania. Wormelsdorf in Berks County which was the site of another wild woman reported to be living in the woods outside of town. In the winter of 1884, the citizens of the town reported the most unearthly yells coming from the hills. Now, Gina, at first they thought they were hearing the cries of an unknown animal in the mountains. So they decided to investigate. Three men, Franklin Ketterman, Jacob Matthews, and Theodore Starts, all old and experienced hunters, followed up a trail for several hours in search of the creature making those sounds in the wilderness. As they went farther and farther into the wilderness of the mountain, they found themselves under some sort of an attack with rocks and even boulders coming down the mountain straight into their path, causing them to dodge this way and that to avoid being crushed. Well, Starts reported spotting something which he described as half-human and half-beast, something he'd never encountered before. Even though he had his gun with him, he didn't shoot. He just stood there frozen in fear at what he saw, at least for a moment. His next instinct, as you can imagine, Gina, was to get away as fast as he could. So he started to run down the mountain and didn't stop till he reached the safety of his own house. Others saw it too, including the employees at a nearby furnace. Several of them shot at the creature and missed. After this, the managers of the forge put out a $200 reward for the capture of the thing and $100 for its lifeless body. For several weeks, though, most of the residents of Wormelsdorf stayed as far away from the mountain and whatever was making those awful sounds as they could. While they did, this creature managed to kill several of the area farmers' chickens and even a sheep or two. Hungry, I reckon. I reckon. After this, a party of experienced hunters went searching for the creature. They found human footsteps in some freshly fallen snow, which they tracked to a shack, a uh, charcoal burner's deserted cabin. And it was here they found a young woman, probably in her mid-twenties, although they couldn't be certain. She was dressed in rags, and she appeared frightened by the sudden appearance of the men. Yeah. According to them, she looked like a wild animal and was very muscular, although very slim. Now, this woman didn't speak, and it appeared she had no idea how to communicate with other people. It was never discovered who she was or where she'd come from. She also appeared in no mood to be taken by any of the hunters who'd shown up at her home, so frightened or not, the men decided to leave her alone and Uh, to inform the authorities. I think that was probably a good idea. Yes. (laughs) And they would let the authorities decide the appropriate course of action to take in the wild woman's case. Now, that story came from the Richmond Dispatch of December 31st, 1884. So there there we have a pattern. Yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, the the description is a tall, slender, muscular woman with hardly any clothes on. Right. Yeah, and wild as a buck. (laughs) Okay, our third story again comes from North Carolina. A woman known only as Tina. Now, this is a little bit different story, but it's sort of in the same vein. This woman, Tina, was said to be living wild in the woods in North Carolina. And a reporter went in search of her to see what she was all about. About a mile west of town, this reporter and his companions found her house, which was marked by a small white flag located 300 yards from the railroad tracks, which ran through deep woods. As the men approached the house, they heard the sound of singing and shouting. And when they got there, they peeked into the window, 
and saw a half dozen or so black women clapping their hands, singing, and, quote, cutting up all kinds of annex, ridiculous to behold, but amusing to strangers, end quote. Unsatisfied at having to simply peek in and wanting to know more, they just walked into the house to find Tina holding court near the fireplace, wearing a red cap similar to those worn by privates in the Army. It was said around those parts that Tina claimed to have killed her only son. Now, this comes out of this newspaper article. Mm -hmm. Tina claimed to have killed her only son to save the black race from sin because Christ died for the whites. According to the reporter, he had no idea if it was true, but it was his opinion that Tina held some kind of religious or mystical power over her followers, the African Americans who lived in that part of North Carolina, and according to him, she had full control over them like a voodoo princess. Well, apparently she liked to have a good time, you think? Or you think they were having worship service? Well, keep listening. You might find out. Now, when they came into the house, Tina became obviously angry. As Mm -hmm. you could fully understand that, some strangers coming in the house. Mm -hmm. She began to cuss them, quote, with the vilest oaths, end quote. No more was written about this encounter except this. The reporter and his companions found a large hole in the clay soil on the south side of Tina's house. Surrounding that hole were a series of small mounds made of dirt, which they called pones. And these pones were covered with paper and situated about two feet apart. Tina called them her holy pones. Okay. Yeah. Forget the pones. What was the hole for, you might be asking? Because these were all around that big hole. Yeah. It was said that Tina would... You know, take her followers and lay them in that hole and then walk upon them for the purpose of pressing their sins out of their bodies. Okay, you know, whatever works. <laughs> now, this <laughs> one, they're talking about a wild woman. And, and I added this to this collection, not because she's out in the woods and she doesn't know what's going on, she's like an animal, but because that's how these people viewed her in the story, calling her a wild woman in the woods. When it sounds to me like she was just some sort of a holy roller preacher and all these women were just dancing and, you know, and making noises for the Holy Ghost is what it sounded like to me. Yeah, it does have that ring to it. Although, you know, this is probably something that even then was probably out in left field. Yeah, it probably this was. This one came from the Charlotte Observer of August 22nd, 1878, so not very long at all after the Civil War. That's very interesting, very strange. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then I guess there's a lot of uh, beliefs like that that may be considered strange and off the beaten path and not normal, but there's always going to be somebody. But... uh, I guess she wasn't as wild as our other wild women then. Well, we got one more story to finish up this collection. And we're going to go back north to Pennsylvania. Now, there's a report of a wild woman who is living in the woods in Ringtown, Pennsylvania, not far from Shenandoah and only a couple of miles from Centralia. Have you ever heard of Centralia? I don't think so. This was the site of an underground fire that has been burning for decades, still burning. Huh? The uh, coal seams underneath the town caught fire, and they have been burning now for probably 40 years, and they continue to burn. They had to abandon the town. And still, if you go up there, you'll see, I guess, what they call the hellfires of Centralia, which you know, maybe we'll talk about in a later podcast. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, this woman up there in Ringtown chased several young men through the woods at one time and was reported to be making unearthly calls, much like the women in the other stories we told earlier. Mm -hmm. In this case, however, it appears that a solution as who the woman might have been was found. Three weeks before this wild woman appeared, a woman named Mrs. Jensley, first name unreported as was usual for newspapers up until a few years ago, uh, Miss Jensley of St. Clair was reported missing after a walk in the same woods with her small children. 
Now, the kids were left in a thicket where they were later found. Now, after a search, it was determined that she had taken refuge in some abandoned mine shafts in the area. No further report on whether Mrs. Gensley or the wild woman, if that wasn't Mrs. Gensley, was ever seen again. And that one comes from the Maysville, Kentucky Evening Bulletin of July 14, 1883. So it was just a single siding just on a, this one? A single siding. Well, it was a single siding according to this newspaper article, but I have a feeling there were a few more sidings beyond that. So all these things happening right after the Civil War, psychologically, again, I don't know what the significance was for all these people reporting women running around. It's like UFOs, like I said. This is where you see one and somebody else sees one and somebody else sees one, and away you go. I tend to wonder if possibly, and this is probably not a novel idea, Mm -hmm. that some people have actually lost their child maybe a baby maybe you know a very young child Mm -hmm. and animals raised it and that's how we come across wild women and how they happen to be women and not any men that's interesting it could also be someone with some emotional disturbance or a mental disturbance gets out in the woods and they just kind of lose it there were probably as many men that did that as women. It's just that was not good press in 1883. I guess not. You know, you're in the middle of the Victorian era. Every, everybody's stayed and upright, and women have their skirts all the way down to their ankles and button their blouses up to their necks. And I guess stories of a woman running around in rags or furs or something with her legs showing and being muscular probably brought a whole lot of sales of newspapers, <laughs> if I had to take a guess. I've been doing this for years. I guess it would work, yep. Yep, it would indeed. So there you go. Four stories of wild women in the woods. Well, three stories of wild women in the woods and a wild preacher. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and all that, folks, it's folklore, whether it's true or not. And it's all part of the mountain lore that we tell here in Appalachia. Now, you can subscribe to the Mountain Lore Podcast in many ways on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many, many more. Till next we meet, sweet dreams, podcast listeners.